Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our live broadcast and others of you are joining us on Facebook Live and Twitter. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Our topic tonight, from an intimate portrait of writer Toni Morrison to the story of the struggle to protect Ghanaian kids from a life of gold mining and the real story of the Green Book, the 21st Roxbury International Film Festival is a cinematic cultural buffet. 68 films showcasing the stories of and about people of color are screening now and through the next week during the local festival. Now recognized as one of the most important events of its kind for filmmakers of color. Joining me tonight, Clinton King, filmmaker of Fair Game, surviving a 1960 Georgia lynching. Vladimir Minuti, filmmaker and director of Vacant. Jennifer Sharp, filmmaker and director of Una, Great Movie, as well as the documentary about making the film called The Chasing of a Great Movie. She is also a writer and editor. And Lisa Simmons, president of the Color of Film Collaborative and creator of the 21st annual Roxbury International Film Festival. Welcome to all of you. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you for having us. All right, Lisa, 21 <laughs> years. <laughs> what, is, 21 what feels years. different, if anything? I don't know. I mean, I, I think what's different is, you know, over these last 21 years, the the way that people tell stories has, has changed, I think, and the, and the ability for people to tell stories has changed. So it's really exciting for us to see from going from 10 films to now 68 films and more women filmmakers. We have a lot of women filmmakers this year, which is really exciting. So, you know, I, I think the whole idea of just hearing these voices and being able to help support these voices that you don't normally see in mainstream media um, is is something that's really exciting for us. So have things changed? There are more stories. There are more deeper stories. There are more, uh, you know, people that are having the ability to do it. But I think that the same mission that we started with, and that was to support local filmmakers and to help those lo local filmmakers tell those stories, hasn't changed at all. Now, so of course, when you say local, you mean the diaspora, because it is international it is film in festival. <laughs> this is true. It is international. But our mission really was to, what we started was to support local, mm -hmm. right? So we still have it in our hearts to support those local filmmakers. But yes, international. And it's wonderful because, you know, the whole reason by doing that was so that the local filmmakers could really work with uh, so it could meet and network with international filmmakers and so you that's all part of film festivals right it's all and film is a collaborative thing yeah you, you have to you can't do it alone um, and the way you learn about new things and the way you learn about different festivals and all of the stuff that's going on is to network with other filmmakers so for us we're a filmmakers festival and we pride ourselves on having filmmakers at the festival and they meet each other and they talk to each other and they've never seen each other before and then they connect at other festivals and I think it's just really you know, part of what we really try to do. And of course, the audience is treated to, as I said, this great cultural buffet of all the films that you all have put forward. One of the things that's so great about this is there's so many different kinds of stories and different ways of telling the stories. And Jennifer, I'm, I'm coming to you because, <laughs> boy, you are very clear about <laughs> not being put in a box about yes. the kind of stories yes. that an African-American filmmaker, a black woman, may tell. Talk about that. Yeah, and it's interesting because I have a very diverse perspective and I've spent some time living in Mexico and and I've as a filmmaker I tell films that I, I believe we should show ourselves in different lights and or who we are and I've actually had problems or not problems but like thoughts with other black film festivals and as a black filmmaker who doesn't do who does things out of the box like where do I fit in in the black film spectrum mm -hmm. and I've made some pretty I think crazy films, but good, you know, that have gotten rejected by all the black film festivals, but into the white ones. And, you know, and it's interesting, not, not Roxbury. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's why you're here. Yeah, why we, we got, got that. that. We got that. Yeah. We got you twice. Yeah. So yeah, I'm in Roxbury and that's why I love, this is so important, like to have uh, festivals and black festivals that understand that we are here to show that we are diverse and that we are different and that we have a lot of different voices and that we all just don't do the same type of things. And Roxbury is so about that from the beginning. I was here 12 years ago and with a movie as well. And when I met Lisa, 
it was I was just like I fell in love with her. I think she's she's so smart, she's so intelligent, she has such a clear vision and she's willing to step out of the box. And, All right. Yeah. Well, Jennifer Sharp's movie Una, great movie, is about a screenwriter who envisions making a diverse film about an African American about African American women traveling to Mexico. But when Hollywood executives ask for changes to the script, well, the premise of the film slowly begins to change. Take a look. I had a dream that one day my black ink and my white paper would make beautifully colored movies that all people could enjoy. You ever want somebody so bad but couldn't because of timing and it tormented your soul but the fact that the love existed at all made you thankful? Remember me? This is not a great movie. You only read up to page five. There are just some lines a film cannot cross. Says who? We need someone happy, like a best friend. But she's lonely and has no friend. Give her a friend. Friend. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it. It's so funny and it's so great. <laughs> so you use humor really to make it's a lot of points. Yeah, yeah, it's humor. And I think that's important, especially in this day and age when we're all so heavy with the political climate. Yes. To be able to make people laugh, mm -hmm. and that's been really fun. And say something deep and poignant at the same time. Like, yes. there's a lot of issues being addressed in this film, a lot. Like, I would say just about every relevant <laughs> issue of the day is in this film. Mm -hmm. But it's all shrouded in humor, so we get to laugh, and that's really important. I think that's great. Um, Clinton, uh, this, along with Jennifer, you've been, uh, had a piece in the Roxbury Film Festival before. So this is your second piece, um, A Fair Game. And uh, tell us about how you came to want to do this particular story. Well, I mean, I, my father, you know, was in civil rights. Um, I'm from southwest Georgia. And, you know, because he represented Dr. King, he was a moving target. He didn't want the sins of the father to be visited on his children. So he shipped us off to New England boarding schools. And so when we would come home for break, I would get in the car with him and we'd spend the day together. And he'd be driving to these small communities where he was representing the interests of black people. And he would start sharing these war stories. This particular story was one of the most important of his career. It was about basically about a black New Jersey mother who five years after Emmett Till moves heaven and earth to rescue her son from a town notorious for lynching. Mm -hmm. And it's... Um, it's the ancestral hometown of, of uh, uh, Whitney Houston, Sissy Houston, Dionne Warwick. And so basically I spent 13 months uh, basically looking at the folk who write the first draft of history, which are journalists. And I went through the newspaper morgues in New Jersey, New York, uh, ultimately down in South uh, Georgia, and got the story together and the storyline together and then began to do those critical interviews with people on both sides of the issue. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was an amazing, uh, it was an amazing ride, but it was a story that my father always told me, and I understood bits and pieces, but I had no idea that it had the scale that it had. And this is nonfiction, a documentary, and, you know, uh, based in the, in the place and the history and the time that you mentioned. So this is a clip from Clinton King's film, Fair Game, surviving a 1960 Georgia lynching. And James Fair Jr.'s sister describes how her brother found himself in jail for a crime he did not commit. On early Sunday morning, Blakely Police Chief G.H. Owen hauled in three black men, including Early B. Gilbert and James Fair Jr. He said, and I went into this boarding house, got me a room, and I was laying down. He said, I wasn't here two hours before that somebody burst in the door, grabbed me up by my collar. He said it was three or four white men telling me that I had murdered somebody. I didn't even know what they were talking about. He said, I tried to tell him, I just arrived here with my friend. I don't know what you're talking about. By sunrise, police released Gilbert and the other man, both who had ties to Blakely. But they kept James Fair Jr. In that situation, that brother didn't have much of a chance. They just put the word out that this colored boy was going to be guilty. So it has a lot of resonance to today um, as we look at this, and, and yet this happened many, many years ago. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about the fact that this film is still alive in the sense that what this man was held for was the murder and the rape of an eight-year-old black girl 
who nobody has ever answered for regarding that. And so this film is now being used as a lobbying point, if you will, for le I'm leveraging it basically to have the governor of Georgia to reopen that case, to get an answer, because the, the, everybody who I interviewed always said, it was a white man who did it. Mm -hmm. It was a white man who did it and nobody ever answered, and this guy became the fall guy, uh, a very convenient fall guy. But mm -hmm. no one ever answered for this eight-year-old girl's death. And so that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. So again, we see that there is a variety uh, in the kind of story being told by and about black folk. So come over to you, Vladimir. And um, your, yours is the one where I had to like look quickly and close my eyes because it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, that means I did my job. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but, and, I, and I'm easily scared. So, <laughs> so talk to about how you uh, came to do uh, your film, Vacant. So Vacant mm -hmm. is a story that talks about the, it's a story about the debate of cannabis that's happening in this country and the debate about social media and how social media is impacting this country. And I took those two ideas and I see a link between the two. I see the addiction of social media. I see the addiction uh, that's happening with cannabis. I also see the discussion that's happening with cannabis around legalization and opportunity. And so I find the debate very interesting. Now, the other thing that I found interesting talking to my friends who smoke cannabis was the fact that many of them, if not most of them that I spoke to, whenever I talked to them about the fact, oh, it's legal, you're able to be out there in the open, how do you feel about people being out there in the open smoking weed? All of them that I spoke to said, I don't, I don't like it. And I found that really strange. And so I talked to them, they're like, yeah, you know, it's cool that everybody can smoke weed. I, I, you know, I think it's great that cannabis is being legal, but I think people should do it in their own private ways. And it felt strange to them. And that strangeness, and that, um, that strangeness is something that I found interesting. And so I took that, and person that loves sci-fi, I took that and I wrapped it within a sci-fi story and I brought that to bear. Mm. Okay, in this clip from <laughs> Vladimir Minuti's film, Vacant, it depicts the mystery surrounding one young woman, Layla, and her disappearance. I'm gonna be closing my eyes. <laughs> definite creepy factor in there with all of the music and everything. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you, thank you. So yeah, we worked really hard to make that vibe last throughout the entire film. This is a film, just like Jennifer, I'm somebody who believes in working with a lot of themes. This is a very layered piece. It's not just a, you know, a gore and scare kind of piece. This, for me anyway, has a lot to say about society, has a lot to say about um, the cannabis debate, like I said, social media, the Me Too movement, um, and so, I, I took all of those things and I brought them all together to kind of speak about the state of the world right now in the negative things that are happening. Mm. Mm. So are these, could these stories be um, told other places, or particularly in Hollywood? I mean, they are all rich, they are all compelling. We sat here and we're all watched you know, with a great amount of attention. Why is it so tough for filmmakers like yourself to get something like that? Um, 
well, out it's, there? Well, it's a challenge because for me, I personally believe that it's a, it's a lack of imagination for a lot, a lot of people that are mm -hmm. the gatekeepers out there. Um, there uh, the story that I, was, uh, that I mentioned earlier when I was speaking to Cavante was that... Um, producer of uh, Basic Black, go ahead. Producer of Basic uh, Black. Uh, associate producer. Mm -hmm. Is um, the story of Danny Glover getting hired for uh, Lethal Weapon. And so Lethal Weapon originally was intended to have two male Caucasian mm -hmm. stars. And so they were going through the casting process, and as they were going through, they found Mel Gibson, and somebody had suggested, hey, let's try Danny Glover. I think that would be a good pair, blah, 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 blah. And at the time, the director, Richard Donner, said, well, we can't, we can't cast Danny Glover. This is written for a Caucasian man. You know, I, we can't do that. And to his credit, he realized that that was there was something wrong with that with that mode of thinking. And so he went back and he said, wait, you know, let me let me take a look at this. And he decided that he was going to cast Danny Glover. And it was because of that decision that allowed Danny Glover to be there. And I feel that that mental state persists to this day. Um, uh, Lethal Weapon was back in the 80s. Yeah. And so a lot of people think that filmmaking has to be made a certain way and presented a certain way and for a certain population. And that is not the case. And a lot of people, I've been told this when I've presented sci-fi ideas, mm -hmm. black people don't like sci-fi movies. How are we going to make this and get make our money back? And I say to them, that's BS. Black well, now people. you can say Jordan Peele. Yeah. Hello. Exactly. 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 Well, it's so, it's you know. so funny because yeah. Jennifer and I were just having this conversation yeah. about mm -hmm. why we choose the films we choose for the festival mm -hmm. because we want to push our audience and we don't want to have necessarily that traditional, you know, linear, you know, film. We want we want the films that are that are going to be sort of disruptive, that are going to counter the narrative, that are that are going to tell the story in a bit of a different way. Um, and I think that that when you come to Roxbury, you definitely experience that. And I think that's why people come back all the time because it, it are they are films that you're not going to see in Hollywood. Uh, they're not necessarily going to get picked up. They're going to do the festival circuit, uh, and that's a great thing. But I think it's important for us to be uh, not not just the filmmakers, but for the audience members to understand that you don't have to consume uh, media in this way. Mm -hmm. There are other ways and there are other opportunities for you to see these incredible stories and mm -hmm. just let it, you know, sort of like wash over you. Yeah, exactly. Like not every yeah. movie is the same. And the thing is, is that we're used to watching movies a certain way. And as right. audiences, we're taught, we're trained how to watch a movie. We're trained what to expect. And if you get to like minute 10 and suddenly there's no conflict, you don't know why, but you're like, oh my God, I'm uncomfortable with this movie. I, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. But actually, the more you start to see different movies, you realize you do like it. It's just we have to break the that cycle. Conditioning. Mm -hmm. The right. conditioning. We're conditioned. Yeah. And then black people especially, because we're told these are our movies, these are urban films, and only a certain sector of black films are actually put in Hollywood that are actually in the theater. But we're conditioned, because we all are, it's a media place, that as black people, we keep seeing ourselves a certain way, and so we're even more conditioned that these are the movies we're supposed to see right. and watch. And I fight that with the black community, that like, no, let's not be conditioned to the movies we're told we could like. And like my, my second short film, Boxed, which was, um, has a whole metaphor about a woman carrying a box everywhere, but and the box represents her issues. But there's a box, and other than that, it's just. And my dad literally looked at me. I was going to play it at my family reunion, a big black family reunion, like mm -hmm. you know, like hundred people. Line dancing, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The T-shirts. Yeah, yeah. And um, my dad actually looked at me, and he was kind of nervous. I was going to play it at the family <laughs> reunion, and he looked at me, and he goes, "You know, black folks aren't going to get this film." Mm -hmm. My That's dad tough. said that to me. That's and, tough. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to do with my film is like break the conditioning, but it's going to take time. I show my film at festivals and there will be people who just are too confused and too uncomfortable with the way I challenge it and they're going to leave. They're going to walk out or be like, I, yeah, I just can't get this, but I feel like I'm still changing them and shifting them for something different. Right. And then there's people who get it and they're like, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know. Well, one of the advantages of a festival is that the filmmakers can interact with the audience, which I think is right. so important right. um, f to show the passion that you all yeah. have, Glennon. Right. Well, in large yeah, part, yeah. that's how mm -hmm. I market my mm -hmm. films. I'm not looking to go out mm -hmm. to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I, I spent 13 years on my first film, trying to get funding, trying to get acceptance, and all of that. And ultimately, I realized that, as, as, as Barack Obama said, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Mm. Right. And so basically I realize the one thing at the end of the day that's the bedrock of everything mm -hmm. is about story. It's got yes. to be about story. And if the story's there, people will stay there all day long. Exactly. The other thing, the other advantage I have, I think, 
as a documentary filmmaker is because I'm interviewing people, people are telling, in some respects, their own story. And mm -hmm. so there's not this question of whether or not they're going to accept it. It yeah. is what it is. Right. And so um, my job is to basically make sure that I, I shape a narrative that's going to be, number one, it honors a truth and, and, and tells a great story at the end of the day at the same time. But no, I mean, the other thing to your point, Callie, the interaction, what I sell basically is a documentary and discussion program. Mm -hmm. And so the, the consumers are generally universities. It's Harvard, it's Dartmouth, it's University of Texas, it's, you know, uh, Georgia Tech. Those are the people who basically bring me in during that 10 week period between MLK Day <laughs> and the end of Mother, uh, right. w Women's History Month and basically. So this is a different situation though in a right. film festival because you're having, you know, all kinds of folks. Right. And, but but I respond. mean, this, but yeah. this Q&A is, is what's yeah. going to happen to, you know, on, on Monday when, yeah. when I screen it. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the Q&A. They need that. Yes. You know, that's, that's us. Yeah. Right. So how is important, how does it change your career, uh, Vladimir, to be uh, recognized in a film because just to get in the festival as Lisa has explained is one step and then there are prizes actually <laughs> uh, awards that are given for best film best direction all of that uh, recognition of skill and talent and story so what does it mean to what can it mean to your career as a filmmaker mm -hmm. it's a it's a huge deal mm -hmm. like, like you said just getting into a film festival is an honor in and of itself and so Having that recognition is huge. It allows you to, to be able to state that to other people. It allow, allows you to be recognized. It allows you to get exposure. All of that is necessary in order for you to be able to get your next project or get the project that you're working on mm -hmm. sold. And so if you've got a project and nobody knows about it, then you know that's an uphill battle for you. But if you can get into these festivals, if you can get in number one and then win, then that exposure is is priceless for you because that allows you to sell that particular project and then it helps you to secure the next one. What about you, Jim? Yeah, I mean, I totally, I, I totally agree. Like it's, it's, um, although I, ha I'm, I don't like judging art. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of like you're a real artist. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't just do my art. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm the same. Yeah, and we were talking about just like learning how to watch a film the way the filmmaker right. wants it Lots watched. Of, yeah. And I really, I kind of want to judge the audience. Like, can you watch? <laughs> do you, are you capable of watching this movie? I mean, it's important. I would love awards, but it's also just like, and it's good for your career if mm -hmm. you get awards. Like, definitely. But I also just like to celebrate the fact that we're all artists, and I don't think you can really compare. Films like in, in a well, lot of ways. It just draws attention yeah. to you. Someone yeah. says, yeah. "Wow, this is a great story. Best, yeah. best story at this yeah. festival." Right. That's totally. Just, yeah. Yeah. But to yeah. your point, it allows yeah. this dialogue to happen between yes. you and the audience, which is immediate, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You get to do the Q and A, like you say, right. and, and and hear people's responses and hear the questions and all the curiosity surrounded around your film. But then it also allows a dialogue between other filmmakers. That's right. That's and so it's really, really a great opportunity to to grow as a filmmaker because you expose yourself to many different markets if you get into other um, festivals across the country or the world and you get different takes on your films that you know you may not have gotten if you were just in one place. How it's, important is it for, for, for you to be in a film festival that celebrates the diasporic experience of certainly African Americans but you know in general people of color? It's huge. Yeah it's super important and it's interesting also as a proof that we can cross cultural borders you know and like this my film I've screened at Brooklyn I've screened at the uh, Brooklyn Film Festival and that was um, mainly white in Brooklyn and then I come to Black Film Festival and I'm actually gonna be doing a Latino film festival next mm -hmm. so that's really interesting that I can do all three of those with mm -hmm. one film and I'm very excited so far it's been well received the Latino I'm gonna be I'm gonna be nervous going to the Latino one too because you know we all put ourselves in these boxes but I believe that um if every audience can like this movie, I can prove that we don't have to just have urban movies and this movie, mm, that I actually right. have a film that crosses. Okay, mm -hmm. right. All right. It's allowed me basically to be able, this is because of the Roxbury International Film Festival, to call myself award winning. And that does matter regarding the marketing. There's yeah. no question about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, Lisa's been very, very kind and very generous in that way. And this for me was an eye opener because I had never been in a, in, a, in a film festival before. This was key. Mm -hmm. It was it was it was it was important encouragement for me to you know take that next step. So Vladimir. yeah, and it's great to be able to show your work amongst another group of, yes. of black peers. artists, mm -hmm. right? To be with your peers, to see what other mm -hmm. people are doing, to get inspiration, to have a dialogue. So all of those things help to really shape you as you're going through this, and and having it be 
a, a festival centered around people of color, seeing all these different stories, seeing the breadth of stories that are out there, it's inspirational and it helps to inform your work as you continue on. Lisa, button on this. 22nd and beyond, where are you going? 22nd and beyond. <laughs> My gosh. I, I, I'm going. <laughs> I'm going with it. I mean, it's, we're, you know, we have a wonderful committee. Uh, you know, we are so passionate about doing this. And with stories like, you know, that, that they're bringing and different narratives, um, it's exciting that we're going to be seeing more of that. And I think that the more that people are telling these different narratives and doing it in a different way, it's going to change the whole makeup of the way that we're watching movies, that people are making movies. And that, to me, is exciting. That's a really exciting part of it. And so we can't wait to continue on for the next. 10 years. Well, my, ed my editorial comment is that it's become an institution in the community, That's right. which I believe is quite That's valuable. Right. I as agree. a whole ed brings something else. Absolutely. All I right. Agree. So, that's the end of our broadcast, and uh, we thank you for joining us in the end of the show, but you are going to want to hang around uh, because we haven't talked about what it's like for the process of making these films and getting getting them into festivals. Um, and you know, what kind of headaches does Lisa have every day putting this on? <laughs> Our conversation continues on Facebook Live and Twitter. Thank you. We are back on Facebook Live and Twitter with our <laughs> post show, continuing our discussion about the 21st annual Roxbury International Film Festival. I promise, <laughs> how do you make it happen in the nitty gritty? <laughs> you said it's, uh, you know, by any means necessary. Uh, right, it you is. said you put those credit cards and everything else together the way that you could. And you mm -hmm. said you pieced it all together the best way you could and you do other commercial work so you can support that. Yeah. So let's have a little you know, more discussion about how you all pull it together. You did a whole movie about yeah. pulling it together. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with I'll you. Start, I mean, <laughs> so I did a, a docu, so I made this movie at the exact same time I was documenting what I was doing and it was in an attempt to raise money because I just basically realized that no one was gonna tell my story in, and I live in LA and that no one was gonna do it. I had to do it myself. So three years ago, I took my life savings and I called all my credit cards and I raised all the limits and I decided that I'm going to make my movie and, and I'm gonna go until I'm living on the streets. <laughs> And part of my getting money was I posted every week my progress and then give me money and like, this is what I'm doing. And that actually turned into a documentary, which is amazing, which is actually screening on Sunday at the Roxbury Film mm -hmm. Festival, Sunday morning. You get to see the documentary, which follows me. Actually, I shot in Mexico, going to Mexico, getting a whole town in Mexico behind me mm. and saying, I have no money, but will you fishermen? Will you, can I use your boat? Can I use your hotel? And this whole town is like, yes, of course, we'll help you. And, <laughs> and it's turned into this thing of showing and, and just faith and like just I'm going to do it. I started. I've gone through all my money. I'm doing credit cards and I'm not on the streets yet. And I have a great movie. And it's kind of exciting. It's just like just doing it, just doing it. Like no one can tell me I'm that's not going legit, to. Too. Yeah. That's legit. Yeah. Just going to Mexico and, yeah. and throwing everything up in the air and yeah. saying that I'm going to do this, yeah. hell, come hell or high water, is and a I'm lot of commitment. And I'm telling you, for any filmmaker, anyone who wants to make a film, they need to come to Jen's film because it is truly inspiring, mm. actually, about how, how you pull it together, mm -hmm. pull it together yeah. and what you need to do by any means necessary. If this is your passion, if this is what you want to do, then, then this is this is this is it. I think most people would just think you all are doing GoFundMe and then just oh, wait for the dollars no, to roll no, in. No, no. No. I went and I went and spent basically, as I said, 13 years trying to raise money and all that. Mm -hmm. And there was one single black woman who was probably in her 80s at some church event, and she sent, she she gave me a check for $25, and I stuck it up on the board, and that was the last contribution I got. And I just decided I was just going to you know just barrel through and just do it and uh so yeah i mean i just decided i was going to get it done mm -hmm. 13 years was way too long yeah 
It's crazy. And crowdfunding is hard. It's a full-time mm -hmm. job. It so is. I mean, it's, it is. yeah, it's, videos, yeah. all that stuff. Is it harder Hosting. now because it's, yeah. everybody's it's a doing thing? it? I, I don't yeah. know. Is yeah, it? I mean, if you're doing like a Kickstarter campaign, you, and you you have to meet your mark, and then you're calling all of your friends and you're calling your family, you're saying at least yeah. we're almost there, we're almost there, and then if you don't make it there, that's it. You, you don't get that it. money. So it's really it, like like Jennifer saying, it's a full time job. You have to hire someone as a full time job to do that kind of crowd right. crowdsource funding. And hmm. you have to cut through all the noise because there are thousands yes. and thousands of other people mm -hmm. out there doing the exact same thing and trying to get their projects funded. Yes. And you have to make sure that you get yours some some sort of visibility amongst all that noise so that you can get to your goal. And I don't want to diminish the role of friends and family oh, in no. terms of you know oh, providing yeah, that. Yeah. I gotta tell you I had a brother I have a brother who basically had um, basically he went to the store and he bought some potato chips and a Coke and he bought a lottery ticket and he won the Powerball. Oh, oh wow. my God. And he gave me $100,000. Oh my Man. God. And Damn I it. used a lot of that to, to, to pay <laughs> off my debts, but I also used it to go ahead and get this film done. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, wow. the universe does what the universe does. Yes. yes. And we've talked about that already. And so, you know, my sister, you know, she allowed me to, to, to stay on, you know, sleep on her floor and, you know, on and on and on, Aqua, mm -hmm. you know, on yeah. and on. No, it just goes yeah. on. And right. the universe does what it does. And that's like when I moved to, my, like I started with $15,000, which was my life savings. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ready to go through it. And then by the time I moved to Mexico, like a couple months later, I had 30000 mm -hmm. And I kept fundraising. And then I shot this all within six months. And when I decided, I was like, I'm going to shoot my movie within six months because otherwise I can't maintain. Mm -hmm. I just have to do it. And um, then I started shooting with uh, $70,000. I had raised that much by within like four months. And we started shooting, I had 70,000, but my budget was 110. So mm -hmm. even when I, I was in Mexico with the town and as I started shooting, I knew I did not have enough money to finish the shoots. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I'm gonna keep going until I'm totally out. And a week into the shooting, I got the final thirty thousand oh. dollars. Like a week wow. into shooting, I thought, yeah. yeah, I thought I wasn't even going to finish, and I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And I was talking to the right person at the right time, and he literally was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you that thirty thousand, finish this movie. Mm. Wow. So, That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. How do you all explain to people because you're all, you know, so passionate about getting your films done to, uh, about why there's something inside that 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 you know you have to finish. You know, that this is something you have to do. You know, how can you explain to those of us who are not artists in that way, I mean, what that drive is? Well, for me, mm -hmm. I, I know there was this saying, I don't know who said it, but it was something to the effect, I don't want to die with my song still inside of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, resonated in a huge, huge way. And that's what I was afraid of, that somehow I would pass and all of these dreams that I had to get done including this film, uh, in this case it was Passage at St. Augustine, mm. was not going to get done. And they had entrusted, all of these people had entrusted mm -hmm. their story to me. And I had been walking around for 13 years with these tapes. And I knew I had a job to do. Mm. There was a responsibility I had. I did not want to die with this song still inside me. Mm -hmm. That was mine. Oh that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty much it. You have this you have this thing that's inside of you, this need, this need to, I'm an il illustrator, this need to draw, this need to tell stories, whatever it is. And the more you don't find an outlet for it, the more you don't use it, it just starts building up in you. It's just this big pressure that starts to build and build and build. And so it's either do that or, you know, you go postal and you start, you know, going crazy. You know what I mean? You just need to find mm -hmm. an outlet for it because it's just building up. And so when that happens, you just have to, you just, you come up with the idea, you get the inspiration, and you just need to find a way to do it. And so that's it. And that's what drives you. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm just right with you guys. It's, and people feel your passion. Yeah. Like, I don't think you even need to explain it. Like, you talk to me for a minute. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's actually also how things happen. Like, I mean, I, my composer is here at the festival, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. And he composed the entire um, score for free mm. and but he felt it and he worked for two years on this movie with me for free and a lot of people have worked for free because they know I don't have it they see what I'm doing but they feel right. I don't think you need to explain it like it's right. when you when you have to do it you have to do it and people right. love that and it attracts people to That's help right. you yeah but, you know there's some people you wouldn't even lend money to you know <laughs> what I mean <laughs> and then yeah. there are others that you just feel the whole thing yeah and I don't want to overlook you uh, Miss Lisa in this conversation because you didn't make the films but you are the convener and the, uh, uh, w w where your touch goes to bring people here is really quite something. Mm -hmm. So what is the passion inside of you to keep convening this conversation? 
You know, I don't know. I um, well, there's two things. One is I'm feeling really stressed out right now <laughs> because I've been sitting on a film for 20 years, mm. and uh, that I oh. that I haven't been able to make. Mm. But my but I've transformed that into supporting other supporting filmmakers, right? So I mean, I think it's a passion. It's funny because my fam my family was all involved in the Negro Theater Project. They were all writers, producers, directors mm. in 1935 to 1939. My grandfather was the stage manager, um, and it's really interesting because my uncle Frank Silvera, who was a well-known actor and started the theater being in L.A. and um, you know, he and and there's, there's this Frank Silvera write, writing workshop that Morgan Freeman I think started in, in in New York as well. And I thought to myself. You know, I was thinking not too long ago, like, this is like part of my history. This is part of my family. They are conveners. This is, you know, my Uncle Frank did it. My grandparents did it. And so it's sort of, it, when you look back on your own history, you can see yourself in that history and doing the same thing in the present day. And that's how I feel like. And so for me, it's, yeah, it's a passion. It's a passion to get these stories out there. It's a passion to make sure that people understand that there is the diaspora and that there is a, you know, a vast, there are vast numbers of stories in, you know, the African American and the Latino experience that we don't get to see. And why is that? And that shouldn't be the way it is. So for me, it's, it's making sure that I find uh, these stories and our committee and everyone who's involved finds these stories that are going to make a difference, mm -hmm. right? That they're not going to necessarily be fluff, that they're actually really going to change people's minds and change people's hearts. And I think that's the kind of stuff that we bring to rock I mean, it's always so wonderful when people come out of a movie and say, oh my gosh, I n never even knew that. I never knew that that story existed. How did, how did I not know that? And I'm like, because you're not taught it. You're not taught this history. You're not, you, we haven't been taught it in school. We don't see it in the news media. This is where you're going to see it. And this is why I always, it's not just Roxbury International Film Festival. It's international film festivals. It's all these like art house in, international film festivals that really give you the opportunity to see these stories that you'll never see before and I think that's what really drives us mm -hmm. and we don't care that we're we don't we, you know we're not a celebrity festival I mean mm -hmm. it's always nice to have a celebrity it brings people in and that's great and we brought in Morris Chestnut mm -hmm. um, with the with the museum and and color connection but I think that for us it was really about taking a chance like you know with Jen's movie and we're I'm like we're gonna open with that and I don't know what the audience is gonna mm -hmm. do with it but I know that we loved it and it was telling this really incredibly different way of telling a story and we're in and we're gonna bring that and we're gonna bring an opening night because we know opening night people come opening night and we're gonna put it with you know Toni Morrison for, first and then do it because we because we knew the incredible value of it mm -hmm. and we wanted to also you know sort of see the the reaction of the audience and have them understand that there is this narrative and there's also this narrative and as Jennifer was saying that we need to help train audiences that that one linear is not the is not necessarily it. And so I love to see when people are getting into sci-fi. My sister, who's the co-director of the festival, Allison, is a huge sci-fi. I mean, she she's brought sci-fi into the festival over the course of the last couple of years, and I think we are all the better for it. Absolutely. Uh, Facebook question, however, a uh, person wants to know what would it take for you to finish oh, your film? Yes. <laughs> Money. <laughs> No, you don't kidding. need money. Just I take know. Your life savings. I do. Right, Jake. My <laughs> life savings. Yeah, you know what I need? I need time, and I mm. need, um, and I need to, and I, and I'm, and I'm, and I am definitely going to make that story because it's true. It's like I am, you know, and I say this all the time. I'm holding on to that story. I'm holding on to these my my ancestors' voices, and I'm not letting them be be heard. Mm. And I feel like. I tell all all these people about the Negro Theater, even when people come, you know, black actors come to be on the stage at the Huntington Theater, and I mm -hmm. say, I just want to let you know you're you're on hallowed ground. Like mm -hmm. this has been, and people are like, what? I didn't even know that, and I keep mm -hmm. thinking, yes, of course you didn't know that because no one's made that movie yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I have all the I have all the documentation, mm -hmm. so I mean, I'm the one who needs to make it. But it it will get made. It will mm -hmm. get made, and and um and maybe in the next five years, but. I you always can say, open your own festival. And I always say, <laughs> right, yes. and I always say there's a time for everything. I'm supposed to be doing this right now. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be doing this work, and this is really great work. And when it's time to finish that, I will finish it. Well, I just want to say I want to see that movie. I'm going to do to you what you did to me. Where's the movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. there you go. Exactly. Where's the movie? So here's I another question for you. Uh, <laughs> do you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> With all of the uh, streaming services, particularly the Amazons, the HBOs, the Netflix, has that helped 
to broaden audience tastes across all kinds of genres and interests, particularly with, uh, with work of people of color. Because, you know, now lots of folks can just sample from their own space in ways that they may not have if they were uh, picking something specifically. You know, I'm going specifically to the movie to see X. But yeah, you're at home and you have a whole... I don't know if no. it's, I think it's just like social media mm -hmm. and how people uh, consume news nowadays. I don't know that it's helped to broaden necessarily, you know, the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know that um, because there's so many, you know, it used to be you were watching TV, it was Channel 5, <laughs> Channel 7, that's and, and that's it. You got three networks, three main networks, and the Cosby show was on, and mm -hmm. okay, you were stuck with the Cosby show, and it happened to be good, so you watched it. And so that forced people to kind of. But see, now ingest. people don't even watch TV. Well, no, that's what I mean. So, so, so no, people, I don't have but TV. Netflix is different, though. It is, but there's so much on there's there, so much on and there. there's so much that's targeted directly to you. That's and what so I was going to say. Algorithms, okay. yeah. and they okay. keep you in your box. Right. They keep right. you in your box. You in your and box. if you're somebody you like who this, just you watch watches this. one thing or one type of thing, yep. then you're just going to get fed that one thing yeah. the whole time. I just but ignored are, it. But, but there are different. <laughs> but there, I mean, to that, to that point, too, though, there are a lot of different stories, right? Yeah. There are a lot of, you know, you can find all sorts of different narratives, documentaries, the, way, the different way that people are telling stories. But you're right, Vlad. It is so busy out there. Like, by the time you're trying to find what you want to watch, I'm exhausted. And I'm like, oh, forget it. Right. Then you take that suggestion, right, so you just, <laughs> and you're just like, I'm going to stop scrolling because right. I've been scrolling for 30 right. minutes. Right. And exactly. I'll take the what Netflix's I, suggestion. Yeah. I'm just going right. to lay here just and relax. Love to scroll, so I'm just <laughs> not. <laughs> I think what Netflix and HBO and Apple and other other um, streaming services have done is have has opened up a, a wider space for distribution for for mm -hmm. filmmakers of color. I think that I think that's a you know, so now you can self-distribute in a way that you couldn't self-distribute before, and people are so hungry for content. Right. And I so I think that you have a better uh, opportunity um, to to be able to find your audience because there is something on Netflix and Hulu and for for and Amazon for everybody. Everyone. But it's it's you can get on there. It's like so then you how do you spend all of your time getting people to find you? You know, mm -hmm. because it is mm -hmm. such a busy space. But right. I mean, so it's it's a so this it's is a weird dichotomy. It's this weird there's like dichotomy. Yeah. There's, there's there's so much uh, yeah. content right. out there that people are getting pigeonholed into certain things. But then there's also this huge amount, this huge breadth that's being made. Right. And the other so thing is, like is that is that disparity. not everyone has Netflix. You know, that's I true. mean, you're saying you're you're talking about a service that's expensive, right? Yeah. And so well, that's and true. so for us, yeah. for and for film festivals, it, it's difficult because yes. now those streaming services are picking up everything out of festivals mm -hmm. before we even get a chance to screen mm -hmm. them at festivals, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like on the phone like with, with, you know, when I see something at South By or I see something at Sundance or I see something at Tribeca or whatever and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get that film and, and someone's already picked it up and it's mm -hmm. already in line for distribution so you can't get it. So that's, you know, for independent film festivals, that I can say that it's been more difficult, difficult. in mm -hmm. getting those films that are coming out of these festivals because they're getting picked up right away, which is good for them, but bad for us. And right. people want to see it on a big screen. Yeah. You want to see a movie yeah. with people, right? right. Yes. Right. So last, com uh, last question, and that's about the communal experience. But again, yes. if you are Netflixing or streaming or even going to the theater, um, it's not necessary. Sometimes, you know, you're sort of in your own space. But when you go to a festival, it's a sort of serious communal experience because everybody together there come to watch these movies. I wonder if it's a different feel uh, than for you all. Oh, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and everybody's excited, and everybody's excited to see the movie and see yeah. what you're doing. And I like I, and during my film last night, um, I went to the bathroom, and another mm -hmm. woman went to the bathroom at the same time, and she's like, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you could just say, yeah, oh, and that's yeah. great. <laughs> I, I, I wish I, w I was wrong. I wish I would have. I wish I would have been like said something and said, "What do you think?" It's totally what I should have done. Yeah, but I know. I was not thinking, and I was uh. like, "Well, I'm the filmmaker." So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like I just said that right away. And I should not have done that. I yeah. would have loved to have the conversation. Right. But yes. just that, even on the way to the bathroom, they're like, "What do you think?" Like yeah. everybody wants to. You want to talk mm, about it. You're great. here because you are challenged to like think and decide if you like it or not, and, yeah. and taste it and all yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. All I right. mean, I always like sitting at the back of the of the theater and just listening to mm -hmm. the audience. Yeah. Uh, you know, sort of a, a, a something on a fly on a wall yeah. and just watching 
what they react to. It's, it's always interesting. It yeah. must be. Yeah. And on that note, actually, there was a guy last night who actually told me, too, and he was like an older gentleman and who's more used to watching things, the, the, and he had a hard time with my narrative. But in the end, he was like, I, he was, it was really good. He was like, I got it. You surprised me. He goes, at first, I just didn't understand it. But there were so many other people laughing that I knew there was something that I wasn't getting. <laughs> <laughs> so he was like, so I stayed. And I, and I was like, there's something about it. And I thought, and then I started to get it. And it's like, she's trying to say something. And I got it. And then I went along with it. And you know what? It was wonderful. Mm. And well, that's that's just great. Well, that's to wonderful. Stick with it. Yeah, that's right. Stick with it. Stick with it. Like, yeah. with it. Yeah. Right. Start that dialogue, right. too. Because, yeah. okay, maybe I didn't get everything. If you can create a work that's layered, that is multifaceted, that allows people to really stretch their mode of thinking and allow for dialogue yes. afterward, that's yeah. you've yeah. done your job. All right. Yes. Well, then that's a testament for certainly the 21st oh, Roxbury yeah. Femme Festival. So I like to end with a little ceremony. So I say we call a little inspirational role. I'll start Oscar Michaud, first African-American filmmaker. Um, wouldn't he be? thinking mm. something to sit here and see all of you and what you're doing. What name are you calling? Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a good one. Well, Spike. I mean, Spike is... Spike Lee? Yeah, Spike all right. Spike is always going to be important. Okay. I know, well, Spike's the one. Yeah. But, uh, gosh. Jeez. That's a hot one. There's so many. <laughs> Come on. Let's take a breath and say Vlad. Okay. Oh. All, right. <laughs> okay. all right. Very good. Thank Vlad, you. what you be calling? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's tough. You know, I'm going to say Casey Lemons. Casey Lemons. Uh, yes, I'm looking forward to her new Eve, thing. Eve Bayou's. Right. Bayou. Right. Great. Okay, we got to give it up to Spike, but Ava DuVernay, mm -hmm. my sister. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you all for what joining me. Thank you me. Yeah, all right. Yes, go ahead. Charles Burnett. All right. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. Charles all right. Burnett. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for Take having care. us. Take care. <laughs>